Hello and welcome. You're listening into the Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. This is Daniel Danovi. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, even though it's my own name, it is fun to say with that emphasis. It just kind of rolls off the tongue. And, you know, I wasn't going to talk about this, but let's talk about your voice for a moment. There was a time in my life when my voice was very nasally because I come from the Midwest and it wasn't, uh, did not have any emphasis, really. In listening to Zig Ziglar and Paul Harvey, uh, how they worked on their voice and utilizing it as an instrument, I decided that was something I wanted to do. Because most of us have listened to a recording of ourselves and say, you know, gosh, I, I can't. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like the way I, I talk. I sound like that. Seriously. And when I first heard myself recorded, I said the same thing. It's like, oh my God, how can anyone listen to me? And over the years, I began utilizing my voice as an instrument and thinking of it as an instrument, as a communication tool. I'm sure that Thomas and I could do a podcast together on the power of your voice, but I just want to leave you with this one idea today. And that is change your voice, change your life, because it is one of the things that people use to determine uh, how valuable you are, of how interesting you are. And like it or not, people make all kinds of judgments, assessments about you due to your tone of voice. And by and large, most people constrict their airways. They, they talk too high in their vocal range. They talk from their throat or through their nose. And it just isn't pleasant to listen to. You know what I mean? When you talk down here from your belly, it really makes a huge difference in how you project. And typically when I do public speaking and the room's not too big, I don't even need a microphone. Okay. So I had no idea I was going to talk about that, but I'll leave it in because obviously it was something that needed to be said. There's this general belief that if it comes into my head, that it's coming through from another realm, that I am the channel uh, to deliver a message. So as I move forward, just one thing that I need to clear the air on energetically is that it's been a tough week energetically on multiple fronts, you know, from, you know, the marketplace that's out there and marketplace, I consider that, you know, what normal people uh, exist in. You know, the day-to-day, -day, the job, the political arena. And I really believe that's not necessarily going to go away anytime soon. But if you've heard me talk about how energy flows through me and how it affects my technology, uh, I've had issues with my technology. My PC, my, my laptop has not been cooperating. And that's what I edit the show on. I also edit my hypnotic audios. I was in the process of editing uh, a customized personalized hypnotic audio for a client and it was taking me forever the program kept hanging up and it kept cycling and I didn't want to close it out because frankly I didn't want to lose the work that I'd already done so I just kind of coasted through it I did a lot of grounding because I figured it was me it was also the message because I was I was imbuing it with a lot of energy which I do with all my hypnotic audios I channel the healing energy into it uh, so it's not just the words, it's not just the tone of voice, it's not just the stories that I tell, but it's also the energy that I put into it. And just so you know, if you have not yet or are interested in uh, having a hypnotic, customized hypnotic audio, go to yesdaniel.com and I'm still opening up to doing a few. And even though I've said that I'm not doing any more because it takes too much time, it's really a labor of love. And I actually enjoy the one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings that I get to have with you. I meet with every client about an hour and I get your backstory. I get to know you. I get to feel your energy. And then I utilize that in constructing a customized hypnotic audio for you. So even though I'm still allowing a few people to come in to do the audios, I will be closing it soon because I just, you know, I can only do so much and I'm doing the podcast. And also I am starting my aligned self coaching program, which is going to take up a lot more time and I'm just not going to have the bandwidth to do these customized audios. So if you want to get in under the wire, I would do so now go to yesdaniel.com and there's a link. Okay, with that said, I want to share an intention that I have in every Monday releasing a, what I refer to as a, a distinction podcast, where I 
introduce you to a concept, an idea, rather than have it be kind of a whole training or a step-by-step process. So a, a distinction is an idea, a concept, a word, a process, a strategy that is made distinct from your normal everyday so you can actually utilize it as a tool. And what defines a master is that they've delineated many, many more distinctions and references than the general public based on their particular area of study, whether it be Kung Fu or Jiu Jitsu or language or hypnosis or personal development or just constructing and manifesting your reality. You get better and better at it the more distinctions that you can create. So in this episode, the distinction that I've been called forth to share with you is something that I identified a few years ago, several years ago, on developing a relationship, a working relationship with fear. And that philosophy is the art of living dangerously. So as I dive deep into this, I'll just give you a little context. My early life was plagued with uh, thoughts of fear, fear of standing out, fear of looking, of not looking good, of being the bad guy. So I abdicated a lot of my self-expression to gain the benefit of the goodwill of other people. And frankly, I sold myself out. But not only did I sell myself out in that arena, I tabled a lot of my dreams because I was just too afraid to step forward. So one of the things I did with the promise, it was promised to me that I could vanquish fear by walking on burning hot coals. So in 1988, I did walk on burning hot coals. And frankly, the day after, three days later, I was still afraid. I still had fear. So (laughs) even though I knew there was something intrinsically available to me inside this experience of walking on burning hot coals, 1200 degree coals, what was promised to me wasn't delivered. And I began to think that it was in how I was processing it. So I began seeking out other people that taught, you know, coal walking, fire walking. And it was actually the second teacher, the second teacher or the second experience that I put myself into that really made the difference in the whole fire walking experience. But what was interesting is I didn't really follow the instruction to the letter uh, of the guy that was leading the class. You know, frankly, I I don't think I'm going to go into that right now. I'm probably going to do another podcast down the road uh, called Lessons from Walking on Fire. But uh, let's just suffice it to say that uh, there was something in that experience for me. Fast forward to 2004, Uh, When I left Federal Express, I went and got certified as a firewalk instructor with Tali Burkan, who is the father of American firewalking. He's the one that taught Tony Robbins and hundreds of others. So after I went through the training, I was a certified firewalk instructor. And I would tell people, I'd go to parties and I'd talk, you know, when I'm talking to people, I'm talking to clients and I would tell them, I'm a firewalk instructor. And they asked, "What, what is that? I said, well, I lead people across a bed, like an eight to 10 foot bed of 1200 degree coals barefoot. And invariably, everyone's response was like, why would anyone want to do that? And they said it in a tone that was like, I was stupid. And it dumbfounded me because I didn't have that frame of reference. To me, it was like, why wouldn't you want to do that? Why aren't you so excited? Why aren't you excited about the possibility of walking on hot coals to call in an aspect of yourself that's rarely called into being in your day to day? No, that wasn't their response. It was like, why would anyone want to do that? In thinking deeper about this interchange, I realized that it really wasn't their logical brain that was talking or questioning, uh, I guess, the validity of this act, but it was their fear. It was their comfort zone. It was so far outside their comfort zone or what they considered to be uh, sane, logical, or within their own self-concept. And your comfort zone is part of your self-concept. It's kind of the boundaries that you forge for yourself. But I realized it was more a conversation about fear and being comfortable. I really began to think about fear, the whole concept of fear and what was the value of fear and its antithesis courage. Then one day I came across a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, and that is Friedrich Nietzsche. It said this, the joy in life is in living dangerously. 
So I decided that I was going to create my own philosophy for fear, and that was the art of living dangerously. Because when Nietzsche was asked, why do you live dangerously? He said, because I'm afraid of everything. So in living dangerously, it is doing the thing or confronting the things that you fear. But I also realized that it didn't have to be that confronting, like really do the things that really scare you. So I thought you could be artful about it, hence my philosophy, the art of living dangerously. So it is artfully and intentionally pushing the boundaries of your comfort zone. It is not about doing stupid, life-threatening you know, activities, although it could be, but that isn't the thrust of the philosophy. The philosophy is doing those things that make you feel uncomfortable, because that feeling of uncomfortableness, that's what people pull back on. That is like the first signal that something is amiss or something could be potentially dangerous. Because I look back on those responses of people that said, why would anyone want to do that? They weren't even in the position of actually making the decision. It was just in the consideration of it. So they were just leaning in the direction of something uncomfortable and they pulled back. And of course, the logical brain, the unconscious brain wants to validate itself. So they would position it in their mind as something that was stupid, something that was ridiculous, something that wasn't valid for them. So this is where you get to look at your own life and what things in the marketplace, what things in the world, what things with other people are you deeming stupid, silly, ridiculous, not even on the table for consideration? Because on some level you feel confronted by it or it doesn't fit your current model of the world. So for me personally, one of the motivations that are behind me bringing this topic, this distinction front and center is that I feel that many of our paradigms in the very near future are going to be challenged and you're going to be asked to view the world in a different way to uh, actually leave your comfort zone in many, many ways. So in recognizing our default pattern in pulling back from those things that are uncomfortable, the art of living dangerously is learning to feel comfortable, feeling a little uncomfortable. So in doing things and engaging in activities and even conversations that are a little outside your comfort zone, you push the boundaries and you actually expand your comfort zone. You increase your flexibility. And speaking of flexibility, here is another distinction and it is called requisite variety. In biology, requisite variety refers to the idea that it is the organism with the greatest amount of flexibility in adapting to its environment that will survive. Those organisms, animals, species that cannot adapt to their environment, adapt to changing situations, will perish. So in the realm of behavior, we want to create more options for ourselves, more options for behavior, more options and possibilities to respond in different ways, flexibility in our environment. The psychologist Abraham Maslow had a quote that said, if your only tool is a hammer, pretty soon you begin to interact with everything as if it's a nail. Here's a real life example. If you only have one way of dealing with frustration, or a predictable pattern in dealing with frustration and anger, then you're going to be limited in your expression whenever you're frustrated or angry. You're going to have a few times when it really works and many other times when it doesn't work, that your response just isn't appropriate. Going back in time when I first began firewalking, for me, the idea of firewalking wasn't that far out of my comfort zone. I wasn't really living dangerously. For me, in living dangerously, it was having the difficult conversation. It was me actually being vulnerable and expressing myself of actually subjecting myself to possible rejection that somebody might not like me or love me. So what is dangerous for you may not be considered dangerous by somebody else. It's really a personal journey, a personal discovery and a personal adventure because it is an adventure in pushing the boundaries of your comfort zone. 
One of my quotes is that when you learn to feel comfortable, feeling a little uncomfortable, you will know that as the spice of life. And you've all heard the aphorism that variety is the spice of life. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. It's pushing the boundaries, doing new things, doing things that you won't readily do or haven't readily done, or might not even be on the horizon as something you would even consider. For instance, I had a woman that was a participant in a presentation that I did for uh, an insurance company. And at that time she was a personal assistant and she started taking on this idea of the art of living dangerously. And she started looking at where is she holding herself back because of fear, because one of the concepts inside this, uh, the art of living dangerously is that fear isn't there to tell you to stop. It's there to tell you to pay attention. Fear was never designed to have you stop because if you stop, you're dead. Because in the realm of your animal nature, if you have fear and you stop, you're dead. Fear is motivation to move your butt, to either move in a direction away or move forcefully forward. And what I've learned by and large as human beings today is that fear is really a communication from your other than conscious mind that this is unfamiliar, this is unknown, we're not sure exactly what to do, so you need to bring all your awareness forward and pay attention. So in six months, she went from being a personal assistant to being the office manager. She actually asked for the position. For the six months uh, prior to her asking for the position, she was practicing the art of living dangerously. She was asking for more responsibility, taking on new projects, stepping outside her comfort zone. She was risking failing. And then she got to a point where she was not afraid to fail. And that made all the difference for her. So as you consider the art of living dangerously, how might you begin challenging the boundaries of your comfort zone? What are some things that you could begin doing? And you may consider your own a uh, little list, but uh, one of the things that I did was I began making my bed. I was living by myself at the time and I was like, why should I make my bed if I'm just going to crawl back in it at night? And my rationale at the time was always like, I didn't want to take the time to make my bed. But then after thinking about it, I realized that it really just took me a minute to make my bed, a minute. And that in fluffing up the blankets and fluffing up the sheet, it felt so much nicer once I crawled into it at night. And I'll admit, I got this idea from a Reader's Digest article that I had read at the time. And there was one paragraph inside this article that mentioned doing something difficult every day, something you consider difficult. And to me at the time, the most difficult thing was making my bed. The next thing I took on was after I pulled the clothes out of the dryer, I folded them right away. I can't tell you how many loads of laundry would pile up on my couch and would sit there and I would begin pulling things out as I needed them on the day. Of course, they were always wrinkled. They were always horribly wrinkled. And this might seem trivial, but it was one of the things that I began to utilize in learning to feel comfortable, feeling a little uncomfortable. Now I cannot not fold the clothes after they come out of the dryer. And then it was picking up dirty dishes and, and dirty clothes and and then it expanded from there to having difficult conversations, asking different women out on dates that I might not have otherwise. It was broaching topics and having conversations that I was reticent in bringing to the forefront, but I figured if I was holding back, it was a command from my other than conscious mind to move forward and live dangerously. And then things escalated to whitewater rafting on class five plus plus rivers and living in the jungle for a month. Then it was leading a group of 25 leaders to India, a place that I had never been before. And many, many more adventures that frankly are too numerous to mention. The more I did that, the more I realized that there was no fallout. There was never any fallout, negative fallout from doing that. It always freed up something more. It always made something more or greater possible. Now, over the years, I've created many facets and many distinctions inside of this philosophy, but it's very simple to begin taking it on. You know what makes you feel uncomfortable. You know the areas that you avoid and pull back from. So in pushing the boundaries of your comfort zone is artfully moving in that direction, leaning in that direction, going a little closer and a little closer to the boundaries, the edges of your comfort zone. 
And you're never going to go that far out of your comfort zone to really where it is just unbearable. Although there are circumstances in life that may thrust you beyond the edges of your comfort zone, and then you just have to deal with it. Otherwise, you perish. The practice of the art of living dangerously actually makes you more resilient, more capable of handling the ups and downs of life, where you develop a certain amount of grit and fortitude, and this inner knowing that there's nothing that can occur in life that you can't handle in some way, that you can't respond to, because you've been practicing being comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. So in building this muscle, that practice of consistently and consciously stepping outside of the arena of the known into the area of the unknown. Like you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's around the corner. And you're okay with that. Because the more you practice it, you realize that everything works out. Sooner or later, everything works out. Now I'm going to add one more concept to this idea. And it's gamifying the process turning it into an adventure. And in that adventure, you don't know exactly what's around the corner. That's the whole purpose of an adventure, to do something, have something new. And the more rigid, the more controlled your life is or appears for you, then this is something that you need to do. Because I'll tell you, as you grow older, your comfort zone shrinks more and more in closer. And that is the danger of wanting to be comfortable all the time. And this thought just popped in my head. I know some of you rarely go out of the house. You shy away from interactions with other people because it's more comfortable just staying home and dealing with yourself, not dealing with other people's energies and even having to distinguish what is your energy and what is somebody else's energy. And long ago, this is how I actually define myself as being shy because I always felt this little twinge of anxiety when I met somebody new. Because I had this internal dialogue like, what if I didn't know what to say? What if I wouldn't know what to ask? What if there, oh my God, what if there are moments of silence where nobody said anything? How uncomfortable would that be? And I thought this feeling of anxiety that I had was telling me to stop, to hold back. Like, and I didn't like that feeling. The more I started to think of it as an adventure to get to know other people, and in talking to other people, I realized that everybody has this little inkling of anxiety when they meet somebody new. So I began to reframe that, that that was the feeling of excitement in the adventure of learning and meeting somebody new, of discovering a new perspective on life. If you want to download the framework of The Art of Living Dangerously, I'll make that available at yesdaniel.com backslash danger. That's yesdaniel.com backslash danger. And there you'll get a PDF download, which gives you the framework of the art of living dangerously. And I invite you to take it on for yourself. Take on the philosophy, the practice, just entertain the idea for the next 30 days and see the difference that it makes for your life. So until next time, live dangerously and enjoy the journey.